so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. Welcome to No Filter. I'm Mia Friedman. I've had a lot of arguments with a lot of people about feminism over the years, and many of them have been with other feminists. This isn't surprising, and it's not even bad. A huge social movement that affects half of the world's population is going to be a pretty broad church with a lot of different viewpoints inside it. And even if you don't think you're part of that movement, even if you don't identify as a feminist, I assume you would agree with the basic idea of feminism, which is that women and men should have the same rights, like the right to vote, the right to wear jeans, the right to decide who you marry and if you marry. The right to be paid the same amount of money for doing the same job as someone else. The right to decide if you want to have kids and if so, when, with who and how many. You know, all the things that men have. And one of the things that has changed women's lives the most actually has nothing to do with feminism. It's to do with science and the creation of the pill. My mother and maybe yours grew up before the pill. And because there was no other form of widely available and effective contraception, my mum was typical of so many women of her generation. She became accidentally pregnant at 17, and because abortion was illegal, she had a shotgun wedding and a baby while she was still at university. That's the way it was for women before the pill, because it's impossible to have equality with men when you're the one whose body can be hijacked by an unexpected pregnancy and your life totally, totally derailed by having to raise that child. It's pretty basic logic. You can't be in control of your life if you're not in control of when, if and how many kids you have. So the pill was a great thing. I think we can all agree. It freed women much more than any other thing more than any kind of legislation. It meant that for the first time in human history, sex was decoupled from pregnancy and child rearing. And this was epic. And it was truly liberating in a way that's hard to get your head around in 2022, when we just take it for granted that sex doesn't have to mean babies. And it meant that women could delay having kids for a period of time or even forever. And it meant that men and women were truly equal in the way that they could have sex without consequence. This was called the sexual revolution and it was a glorious time, apparently. Happy days. Because women should be able to have sex with whomever they want, for whatever reason they want, without fear or moral judgment or unwanted pregnancy. I believe that totally and completely and so does every woman I know and most of the men. But what happens when what you believe in your head to be true doesn't match with your feelings? What if there have been negative consequences to all of this sexual freedom that a lot of women experience but don't feel like they can admit to? This episode of No Filter is going to push some buttons. It's going to challenge you. Certainly challenge me. Even the name of this episode is confronting how the sexual revolution failed women. The result of the sexual revolution, both in the material and the ideological components of it, is that women have been encouraged to imitate the high sociosexuality male model, right? That that's considered now to actually be aspirational. It used to be the opposite, right? It used to be that women had to kind of suppress any desires that they had to have casual sex or to be sexually adventurous or whatever. Whereas now I think the pressure is in the other direction. Louise Perry has written a book about this. And it's currently igniting a viral conversation about how sexual freedom can have a downside for women. Not all women, but some women. And also some men. We're going to talk about porn. We're going to talk about hookup culture. About the toxic phrase, catching feelings. About the pressure to have sex like a guy. About prudes versus sluts. 
about why a lot of women are having sex that they don't enjoy. Strap in. It is a cracker of a conversation. So, you know, we'll have people listening to this who are all different ages. And I would love you to start by explaining what the sexual revolution was. It's kind of two things, right? I mean, it's a, it's a big historical event. It's a big complex historical event that is, that has happened really around the world, although in different ways. So one part of that is material. It's about this amazing technology that arrives in the world for the first time in the history of the world in the late 50s, early 60s, the pill. We call it the pill with a capital P, right? Because that's how important it is. It, it sets it apart from all other kinds of pills you might take. And it changes everything, right? Because it suddenly becomes possible for the first time ever for women to control their fertility and to have reliable contraception that was never available before. So it's the pill and and other changes too, things like the kind of work we do is so different from how it used to be. We have washing machines, we have tampons, we have, you know, all of these amazing technologies, which make it a lot easier for women to participate in public life and to delay childbearing and to basically shrug off a lot of the burdens although they are so wonderful burdens, you know, depending, that our foremothers used to have no control over. So there's that material change. There's also an ideological change. And there are all sorts of ideas that come out of the 60s and come out of the kind of reckoning with the Second World War, which have been really, really influential. One of the ideas, for instance, that comes out of the sexual revolution, which is, I think, a harmful idea, is the idea that sex doesn't necessarily mean anything. It doesn't necessarily have any kind of special status. It definitely doesn't have any kind of sacred status in a religious sense. You know, all religious traditions have some kind of sacred ritual status, whatever, associated with sex. But this new ideology, which we we discover in the 1960s, says no, that's all a kind of hangover from the past. It's not only irrelevant, it's actually oppressive. Mm, so it's all about free love. Yeah. And, you know, if people want to invest their sexual relationships with meaning, then they can, but they don't have to. You know, it could be that having sex with someone is just as meaningful or meaningless as shaking someone's hand. And I think, honestly, no one really believes it. Mm. I think it's a sort of idea that people will talk about that has a lot of rhetorical power among some progressives. I don't think, though, that anyone actually lives as if that was true. And one of the things I try and kind of drill down into in the book is the points of contradiction, the points where you have people on the one hand saying, oh, of course, sex is just like making a cup of coffee, shaking hand, you can buy it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you like with it, who cares, right? But people aren't actually behaving as if that's true. People are behaving as if actually sex does have a special status. And it might not be one that's very easy to describe, it might not be easy to rationalise, but we really, really feel it. How are they behaving in ways that that is, you know, contradictory to the idea that sex is just whatever, as meaningless as a handshake? So one example, for instance, is that even in polyamorous communities where people will try really hard to practice so-called ethical non-monogamy and will invite their partners to have sexual relationships with other people and they have sexual relationships with other people in their turn, people find jealousy really, really difficult. You know, you go on any sort of online platform or talk to anyone involved in polyamory and they'll tell you that this is one of the things that people are always struggling with. And often in a very kind of visceral sense, right? Like my head is telling me one thing, my head is telling me that this is fine, that we're all consenting to this, that what that this is just a kind of a way of throwing off the shackles of monogamy, which were oppressing us, et cetera. There's like a political program, which I'm completely on board with, but my, like my bowels are telling me something else. Mm-hmm. There's that disjunct between head and heart. Mm. And that's something that loads and loads of people will talk about. And which doesn't really make sense if you think that sex doesn't really mean anything you know no one feels that way about their spouse having like playing tennis with someone else Mm. or doing any other kind of neutral thing with someone else no one has that kind of visceral gut level yeah 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 exactly and I think that that tells us something about how much in a way our kind of animal selves are are in charge (laughs) right like one of the sort of principles that I'm starting with is is the idea that Look, we are animals when it comes down to it. We're very clever animals. We're very socially sophisticated animals. We're very complex. But 
there are certain ways in which we're led by our emotions and by our evolutionary history. And we can try really hard to override some of our animal instincts, but we can't succeed entirely. And I think sometimes it's unwise to try. You've got a chapter in the book, early in the book, called Men and Women are Different. Mm -hmm. Can you explain some of the ways in which we are different? Because in some points of view, the idea of equality is trying to say, but we're not different. We all need the same opportunities. But you make some points about the fundamental differences between men and women. So I think it's completely consistent to say that men and women are morally equal. What do you mean by that, morally equal? I think that as human beings, we're all, you know, every single one of us is as valuable as any anyone else, regardless of our talents, abilities, whatever, you know. But that doesn't mean that we have to say that men and women are identical. There are some ways in which we're physically different, which are fairly obvious. You know, women are the ones who get pregnant. We're smaller than men and we're less physically strong than men. Quite profoundly so, more than people often realise. I think that if you don't do manual work or you don't do the kind of sports that really emphasise strength, you might not realise. The Part of my thinking from this comes from the fact that I've been doing weightlifting for so many years and you can't step into a, a powerlifting gym and not realize that men are in so much stronger than women it's so annoying you'll see some like novice man warming up doing bench press with my one rep max which I like mm. trained years and years <laughs> for you know it's it's just the nature of testosterone that men's upper bodies are are hugely more developed than women so it's obviously relevant for powerlifting, but is also relevant in a social sense because it means that any time you have a man and a woman alone together it's almost always the case that the man could kill the woman with his bare hands and the woman cannot do the reverse, right? So there's an obvious power differential there that you, you just kind of have to reckon with in a social sense. So you've got the physical differences. The psychological differences are a little bit hazier. They're much more open to kind of social, cultural influence. They're averages. You've got plenty of people who are outliers in every possible direction. And, you know, there's there's... There's nothing wrong with being an outlier by any means. It's just the nature of having averages that you will have some crossover. And, you know, there are certain ways in which men and women do tend to differ. And on an individual level, that might not tell you very much, but at a population level, that does tell you quite a lot. So, for instance, the fact that women tend to be more agreeable than men. This is this trait that psychologists call agreeableness, but we would probably call it niceness. Mm. It's kind of your tendency to put other people first to be very softly softly in social interactions etc etc it's one of those traits that has good sides and bad sides because you know agreeable people tend to be really lovely to be around they tend to be really likable it's also bad sometimes to be agreeable because you have a tendency to sublimate your own desires just think how agreeable you have to be as a mother in relation to your children right yeah. constantly constantly putting yourself second so it's a good trait it's also sometimes a painful trait you're saying some of those are like developed through evolution to ensure the survival of our species because if yeah. you had women who didn't put other people first, then children wouldn't go so well. Yeah, there are various theories about why the agreeableness gap is there. One of them is to do with the fact you just have to be so super agreeable towards your children. I mean, a really interesting insight in this regard is that you don't see a gap until puberty. So boys and girls, even, you know, aged eight, nine, 10, like quite old children, there's no gap in this trait. And then in puberty, it suddenly hits in, which does suggest that there's something to do with that with childbearing. I mean, so one theory is it's to do with the fact that you just have to be so self-sacrificing towards your own children. Another theory is that it's a way of, you know, if you're a mum with little kids, you really don't want to have any kind of aggro going on around you. And if you're really agreeable, you're probably better at diffusing that and like creating a safe environment for your children. There are various like theories as to why this might have arisen, but it's quite a big gap. It's not a, there are plenty of disagreeable women and there are plenty of agreeable men, but like you see it in the data and there is a stereotype there, which is rooted partly in truth of women in general being a lot kind of softer and nicer in social interactions than men, which does seem to be kind of representing that data. Another difference, which is even more profound difference. And the one that is most relevant to my book is in a trait called sociosexuality, which is not quite the same thing as sex drive. 
in that you can be high in one and low in the other. Sociosexuality basically describes how interested you are in sexual variety, how mm-hmm. many different partners you want to have, how quickly what you want to jump into bed with someone, how sexually adventurous you are in general. And so a men have a higher, is that a called a higher rate of sociosexuality or a different type because they're meant to perpetuate the species, impregnate as many different women as possible, like Nick Cannon, who used to be married to Mariah Carey and has got like 10 children with all these different women. <laughs> is that what sociosexuality is? Yeah, it is basically your desire to sow your wild oats. Yes. Yeah as my grandmother would say. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that something that's really interesting about one of the ways that male sexuality differs from female sexuality is men have a wider range of behaviours and men are more flexible actually than women are in a lot of ways. So typical female sexuality with outliers obviously is generally much more geared towards monogamy and knowing someone pretty well before you want to start a sexual relationship with them and so on. With men, Some men, that's absolutely what they're interested in. You know, some men are just as monogamous as the most monogamous woman. Some men are really quite low in sociosexuality. Some men are extraordinarily high in it. And it's something that changes across your lifetime. And it's something that changes also according to context quite a lot. So, you know, men who who might be perfectly happy living a, a, a pretty like steady eddy lifestyle, but in another context would be super promiscuous if they had the opportunity. And is that where porn can come into it, that they seek that variety through porn? Potentially, yeah. Like on the nature-nurture question, I think the answer is very obviously that it's both. It's nature and it's nurture <laughs> and they work together. I think that seeing it as either one or the other is is kind of like a crazy dogmatic position. Mm. It's clearly both together, which is the whole point I'm making in the book, right? Like I'm taking this evidence from the nature point of view but also there wouldn't be any point me writing this book or campaigning on all the issues I campaign on if I didn't think that there was scope for change. So like, it's not a bad news story, (laughs) but it is like working with what we've got basically. And the fact is that we do have this difference in sociosexuality between men and women, and you see it across cultures, all sorts of really different cultures, you still see this exact same pattern. And the explanation that's been used for this sometimes by people who are more towards the nurture side of the equation is to say, well, this is to do with women being slut shamed, women's sexuality being suppressed. And, you know, women would be higher in sociosexuality if they had the opportunity. And it's possible that sometimes that's true. I'm sure that there are individual cases when that's true. The thing that makes me skeptical about that being the explanation for the gap that we see everywhere is it's kind of like flipping a coin hundreds of times and every time it comes up heads. You know, I, I feel like there reaches a point where if you've got so many diverse cultures that are all producing this gap that probably suggests that there's something biological going on this isn't just to do with kind of the luck of how a culture decides to regard human sexuality the argument that i make in the book is that i think that the result of the sexual revolution both in the material and the ideological components of it is that women have been encouraged to imitate the high sociosexuality male model, right? That that's considered now to actually be aspirational. It used to be the opposite, right? It used to be that women had to kind of suppress any desires that they had to have casual sex or to be sexually adventurous or whatever. Whereas now I think the pressure is in the other direction and it's all about kind of... Sex positivity. Yeah, and it's persuading women. I mean, that persuasion process is sometimes pretty direct, you know, like I've read accounts from women, I've spoken to women who will talk about boyfriends or hookups, you know, being pretty explicit in in, in their desires for, for women to be more adventurous, to jump into bed more quickly than they want to, all that kind of stuff. So sometimes it's actually quite coercive in a direct way. But I think often it's actually more subtle than that. It's more sort of in the cultural waters, mm. this feeling that actually being really up for it is now high status. And what a lot of young women say they're now scared of is being a prude or being frigid or getting laughed at because they're a virgin, which is historically really, really weird, right? Because up until the pill arrived, really, of course, teenage girls were expected to be virgins. Mm. That was just the accepted thing because there's just necessity, really, mm. that that you would you were expected to wait to have sex until you were in a relationship that could like cope with having children. But if you take the pregnancy factor out, I mean, you can never take it completely out. I think this is 
this is a thing about the pill that is kind of a double-edged sword for women in some ways, that it, it is very effective. And the new methods are even more effective, things like the marina coil and stuff like that. They're really effective. But the pill that arrived in the 60s was not that effective. It was like, I think with perfect use, it's 97% effective or something like that. But with typical use, it's more like 91% effective, which actually means that in a year, if 100 women are, are taking it in a year, nine of them will expect to get pregnant. After the break, Louise is going to unpack the problems with hookup culture and not catching feelings during sex. Generally, the pill and the sexual revolution decoupled pregnancy and morality from sex. And you start your book by talking about Hugh Hefner and Marilyn Monroe, who were born a day apart, and how the sexual revolution had very different impacts on their life. Can you talk a little bit about that? What were they? Yeah, the Marilyn Monroe Hugh Hefner thing is amazing. I didn't know until I looked it up that they were born exactly the same time and they both lived in LA. They also buried in the same place because Hugh Hefner, in his final act of creepiness, bought the grave next to Monroe's. That is so creepy. I know, even though he died so many decades later than her. And bearing in mind that they never actually met, but their sort of most striking interaction was when he bought nude photos of her, which she had taken because she was really poor and she needed the money as a younger woman. And um, he bought them from the photographer. He didn't pay her a penny. And he used clothes photos on the cover of the first Playboy and then used her as the naked centrefold. And he said later that he thought that the fact that he was advertising nude Marilyn photos was the reason that Playboy was such a success. But she never got any money out of it. She was never asked for her consent. It was just kind of the most jaw-dropping but also so typical of the era, but also still now, really. I mean, I, I don't think that there's any greater respect paid to actresses, and including porn actresses now, than there was in the 60s by any means. I think there's still that, you know, real riding roughshod over women's consent and women's dignity. And, you know, it's really no surprise that Marilyn Monroe had a, she had a really hard life. She had a really hard childhood. She suffered from domestic violence. She died as a result of substance abuse at a young age, famously. Whereas Hefner had a great life. I mean, well, he would say it was a great life, right? You know, he always had a, a, a harem on the go of like gorgeous young blondes who all remain the same age, even as he got older and older. He had all these glamorous parties. He was this iconic figure and very wealthy and very successful and so on. He was a real beneficiary from the sexual revolution. And he was one of the the people who pushed for things like the pill to be made available to unmarried women, because when it was initially brought on the market in the US, it was only available on prescription to married women. And he was pushing for its extension, which sometimes, you know, when he died, some of his eulogists said, yeah, oh, such a feminist. Wasn't he? Yes, I know. What a good bloke. And he, he, like, can you think of any reason like he might have had a personal stake in, in, in pushing for this, right? Yeah. I mean, I do think with Hugh Hefner that even though I guess he would have regarded his exploits as huge fun, I think that he did end up being a pretty pathetic figure. Even though he tried his very best to deny it, that, that kind of playboy life does have a shelf life. And if your whole sense of self is bound up in the idea of basically having as much casual sex as you can and being as randy as possible... Like that doesn't really work when you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, right? Like I disagree. I think it works for men in their 50s, 60s, 70s, potentially, but it got pathetic for him right at the end. You know, he died at 91, still with all these young girlfriends, and Marilyn Monroe died in her 30s, and her end was equally, you know, sad, I suppose. I wouldn't call it pathetic, but... You're talking about a difference of 60 years and that's what I wanted to ask you about. You know, your premise of the book is that the idea of the sexual revolution was sold to us as great for everybody but you're saying it was really great for men because there was a whole lot more sex on tap without consequence. But for women, are you sort of saying that we've been gaslit into believing complete sexual freedom 
is a good thing, but ultimately has it benefited women? And of course, we're generalizing. We're not talking about outliers, as you say. Maybe gaslit is too strong. Although actually the phrase that my grandmother used, my Australian grandmother, so I'm going to get her to listen to this, is that women have been conned. That was yeah, the phrase that she conned. used when I when I explained it to her. And it- Maybe that's a better word. We've been conned <laughs> into believing that sex positivity and the idea of lots of casual sex and ha- being able to have sex like a man is a good thing. Why has that been a con? I don't think it's a con in the sense of I don't think it's a conspiracy. I don't think that anyone has kind of sat down and set out to make it like this. I think, you know, with the exception maybe of the likes of Hugh, Hefner, yeah, right, right? Yeah. he really he really <laughs> did want to, you know, make the pill as widely available as possible for his own purposes. Mm. So with some interpersonal kind of exceptions, I think what's going on more is that I think it was completely rational for feminists of the second wave to look at what had come before and the fact that women had been so restricted in terms of, I mean, their lives in general, but their sexual lives in particular, and to see the links with religion in particular, and to kind of think, okay, this is our enemy, this is our problem. This is what we need to be fighting against. I think this has been particularly true in America. I think maybe less so in the UK and Australia and other parts of the world. But I think particularly in America where the Christian right is still a very fearsome enemy and there are very obvious ways in which the Christian right want to make women's lives more difficult, as we've seen through the fall of Roe recently. I think it's very easy to sort of set up this binary and say that was the problem. I think the problem with doing that, though, is it it presents a really simplistic view of history and a really simplistic view of how complex social norms work, right? Because what we've done basically as part of the sexual revolution is we've said, okay, all of these sexual norms of the past, they got to go. You know, chivalry, it's out, right? Like the idea of chastity, it's got to go for men and for women. And all we end up left with and you know even the idea that sex shouldn't mean anything that it's basically you know it's got no state special status whatsoever what you will end up with is the consent framework which says that as long as you're capable of consenting and as long as everyone does then it's fine the problem with that is that actually there are so so many examples where actually the consent is there but actually it's not fine and it's very obvious that there are either downstream consequences that are really bad or actually that people, you know, their well-being is not being protected. I try and use this word well-being. Like what are the examples of that? So for instance, I think that it is so common now for young women who've grown up in this culture where this is completely normal to feel under intense pressure to participate in hookup culture. How do you define hookup culture? I mean, you might also call it a culture of casual sex. So the idea that it is not only permissible, but actually good and aspirational to have sex with someone uh, very early on if you don't know them and potentially to have sex with someone just the once. This is now completely normative on university campuses, increasingly also in schools. I mean, we've had this really grim scandal in the UK recently It was called Everyone's Invited. So a schoolgirl set up a website called Everyone's Invited, where she she basically invited girls at schools in London and then it spread to give examples of basically Me Too incidents that they'd experienced either in school or more often actually at parties and stuff with other boys. And it was basically exactly the same kind of stories as you've been hearing from university campuses for ages Stuff that I, I mean, I'm 30, so this, and, you know, my school was on there, so I was mm. I was reading these accounts from girls who've come after me, and it was stuff that actually was pretty, like, wasn't going on even 10 years ago or 15 years ago. But, like, what kind of stuff? Things like so much revenge porn being spread around schools, so much pressure on girls to take nudes of themselves, which then end up getting spread, to do things sexually with boys that they didn't really want to do, but then that's that, oh, I'll tell everyone at school you're frigid kind of threat. Sometimes not as explicit. I mean, this is the whole problem with the consent framework is there's a lot of space between jumping the legal consent bar and actually behaving well, right? There's this massive gray area and the consent framework can't really deal with that gray area because there are loads of reasons why someone might consent to something even if it's not actually in their best interest and even if it doesn't actually make them happy. So they might do it to prove that they're not approved because they feel it's expected. Yep, to please a boyfriend. Yeah. In the hope that maybe they'll get a long-term relationship 
out of a hookup because often that's the, the way that girls feel now that they don't have the option of of holding out for a long-term relationship and waiting to have sex so they'll go with the hookup culture flow because that's what everyone's doing and that's the path of least resistance and then they actually end up having these sexual encounters which make them really miserable and there's loads and loads of survey data asking women how they feel about one night stands and and, and what they'll say generally is like you know I'm consenting it's not like th- these aren't sexual assaults but also they leave me feeling terrible they leave me feeling you know, disrespected and upset and I feel like I've been used and all this stuff. And and to be honest, you look at the counterpart surveys with young men and they're kind of right. Like young men will say, yeah, I do use women for sex within this context. I do have sex with women that I don't, you know, I mean, they won't say this in surveys, but basically I wouldn't care if she got knocked down by a bus next week. Like there's just no loving relationship there whatsoever. And yes, maybe everyone's consenting, but actually, is this a healthy sexual culture? I don't think so. I mean, definitely not. I think for girls who are, you know, as we're saying, they're suffering all the risks associated with these encounters, which are sometimes violent, which do sometimes result in unwanted pregnancies. And they don't even really want to do it. I mean, just things like the orgasm gap. Women so rarely orgasm in, during one night stands. They're so much more likely to orgasm in committed relationships. In fact, women are more likely to experience pain during sex in one night stands than they are to experience an orgasm, right? So just on a purely physical level, the odds are terrible. (laughs) But also actually on a social level, you know, there is potentially some social status to be had in in feeling desirable, in feeling wanted. I can completely understand the feelings of a young woman who enjoys that feeling of being desired, even if a one night only, like I completely get it. There's that little self-esteem boost. But the problem is that then not being called the next day often makes it so much worse. Like it takes away any possible enjoyment that you might've had. And the reason I think that it's not quite a con, except in a few exceptions, is that I think it's a narrative we've all kind of collectively knit together in a way. And I think part of the reason that we've done that is it really sucks to view yourself as being used, right? It really doesn't feel nice to think that all these guys I've had sexual relationships with, they actually don't care about me at all. You know, they were just using me for sex. I went along with it. I don't even know why. Like, that's a really hard thing to come to terms with. I think it's a lot easier to kind of throw yourself into the sexual empowerment narrative and say, no, I'm having sex with a man. I'm choosing this. I'm throwing off the shackles of the past. I choose my choice. Like it's a really appealing narrative and I completely get it. Mm. I think what I've often observed though, is it only really goes in one direction, right? Like it's often the sort of narrative that you'll kind of cling on to when you're right in the thick of it. Cause hookup culture is really a young person's game, right? Mm. You'll cling on to it when you're in the thick of it. And then it's only later on that you think, hang on, <laughs> like, Was that really good for me? I don't think it was. I know so many women who've traveled that emotional journey and I don't know anyone who's done it in the opposite direction. Tell me about not catching feelings, this cultural idea that's sold to young people about not catching feelings. What does it mean? It's such a horrible phrase. (laughs) It treats feelings like catching the flu or something, like some horrible... Or an STD. Yeah, some horrible disease that you have to avoid. Not catching feelings is the phrase used to describe when you have sex with someone, but you don't want to actually fall in love with them or even feel like affectionate towards them. And it's the sort of phrase that is kind of presented as being gender neutral. And there clearly will sometimes be cases where it's men who are the ones who are struggling not to catch feelings when they're having a casual sexual relationship. But most of the time what's going on is it's the other way around. It's mostly to do with women saying they're working really hard to not fall in love with the men that they're having sex with. And sometimes using quite like, I I really dug into um, women's magazines for the book and you come across these really quite dystopian guides sometimes, you know, how to hook up like a feminist, how to enjoy sexual empowerment, et cetera, et cetera, which will include tips on how not to catch feelings. And some of the tips are things like don't make eye contact with your sexual partner because making eye contact with them can actually, you know, induce oxytocin, et cetera, which will make you bond. Take drugs like cocaine because that will like dull your hormonal responses to sex, things like that. And you think, why are women thinking that this is something they have to do? That trying to sort of deaden their instinctive 
loving responses, you know, falling in love with someone is a good thing, right? Like, why are we going around pretending like that's something that actually has to be resisted? Well, I guess it's like back to what you said about trying to reclaim a situation as being about your choice. The fact that it's just casual sex and it goes no further, trying to say, well, it was my decision not to catch feelings and I'm not going to catch feelings. But what you're saying is that we're denying our basic human female biology in many cases to generalise, which is to find Mm. a partner. And also the fact that the nature of sexual asymmetry is that women can have a child like max once a year really much less frequent than that in reality, but you know, max once a year because of all of the pain and difficulty of and danger of pregnancy and childbirth, and then also infant care mm. for so many, many years afterwards, right? Whereas in theory, men can reproduce every time they orgasm, which is an inherently massive asymmetry, right? And it does mean that women in general have evolved to be a lot pickier about who they have sex with. This is something you see in other species as well that have a similar kind of asymmetry. We're much more sort of wary about who we have sex with in general because obviously for us, and and bearing in mind that, you know, we don't have reliable contraception until five minutes ago in terms of our evolutionary Mm. history. You know, Mm. we've got 200,000 years of human history and, and, and we've had 60 years of the pill, which isn't even completely reliable as we've discussed. So like, your monkey brain is not operating on the assumption that you're on the pill. It's operating on the assumption that sex potentially leads to pregnancy. And there are all sorts of clever experiments about this, you know, where you you go on a university campus and attractive strangers walk up to male and female students and proposition them. And most of the men say yes. And the ones who don't say yes, it's normally because they've got a girlfriend or some other reason like that. Not a single woman says yes. No woman is going home with some random guy who's just come up and propositioned her on the streets like this this is you know completely unheard of you can also see it in things like women have a lower sexual disgust threshold than men tell me about that so that's something you can measure with quite objectively because you can measure it with things like sweat and heart rate and blood vessel dilation and stuff so you can hook people up to monitors and then expose them to different sort of disgusting things like maggots or you know whatever it's much easier to kind of turn women off sexually than men so for instance women are really reluctant to have sex with someone who they think looks sick or you know in any way looks like they they might be carrying a disease and and that's probably partly to do with the fact that women are more vulnerable to getting STDs just the nature of penetrative sex means that women are more vulnerable it's also probably to do with the fact that women have to not only protect their own health but they're also thinking about not passing diseases onto their children through pregnancy and through breastfeeding it's also I think to do with the fact that women are just it's really not in our interests to get knocked up by some bozo, right? Like <laughs> being very, very selective about who you're willing to potentially have a child with is completely in our interest. I think that's what's going on with, I don't know if you've heard the phrase, the ick. Yeah, of course. I think that that's what the ick is describing, right? That you're kind of into a guy and then you, something triggers your sexual disgust response, like whatever it is, his behavior, something physical, whatever. And you're like, oh no. And suddenly your whole body is telling you absolutely not to this. And it's interesting that the ick is clearly something that women are talking about and what men aren't talking about. I imagine there are probably examples of men getting the ick as well, but the way that you read about it and and everyone talks about it, it seems like it's a female phenomenon. And I think that's probably what it's describing. It's the lower sexual disgust threshold just expressed more pithily. You know, to finish, Louise, I wanted to ask you about the idea of empowerment and sexuality for women and how we have somehow been sold this idea that objectifying ourselves in the way that men used to objectify us, because it used to be Hugh Hefner who published nude, sexually, you know, graphic photos of women. Now you open Instagram or you go on OnlyFans and women are doing that themselves and it's called empowering, whether they're doing it for money or not, because they're in control of it and I do understand that argument. So the idea that anything sexual that a woman does is empowering because she does it without kind of any recognition that we're in this culture that's very much playing still to what a man considers sexually desirable. And, you know, whether it's a woman who's 50 
posing with no clothes on because she looks young or someone having sex and not catching feelings, that's empowering. Having sex like a man is empowering. I mean, I guess for some women it is. But are we kind of kidding ourselves? Like you, you have a chapter saying loveless sex is not empowering. I mean, I guess maybe it's empowering in the sense that it's a vicarious sort of power because what's really being described there is is the power that comes through men finding you attractive, which is the genuine source of power, you know, as any kind of consort to the king will tell you, right? Like sometimes women can access power through having sexual relationships with powerful men. It's a very fragile kind of power that's completely dependent on his whim. And it's a power that potentially comes with a lot of costs and a lot of vulnerabilities. It's not at all the same thing as being the king yourself, right? So I wouldn't want to say that it's, that that sort of power is not a factor or not a genuine result sometimes of um, kind of using your sexual capital is the the horrible phrase that I've heard used. I think it has been a mistake though for us to think that if only we can behave like men, if only we can kind of have access to the sort of sexuality that men have historically had access to. I think it's all to do with this this reaction against the Christian conservatism of the past in the 1950s, right? That's always the phrase, the 1950s. We mustn't go back to it. It was not a good time for women then. It really wasn't. No. The problem is just flipping it on its head and saying, okay, well, if we do the exact opposite, then everything's going to be right. The problem is that history is really complicated, like, Social relationships are really, really complicated and it's very, very rare that you can just kind of take one negative social phenomena and just do the exact opposite and, and it's all gonna, it's all gonna work out. I mean, we've kind of had a grand experiment in what happens if you give that a go. And I think one of the reasons why I mentioned earlier that Gen Z seem to be turning against porn. I mean, there's quite a lot of evidence that Gen Z are in general turning against a lot of the sexual revolutions ideas. It's a bit of a complicated picture because there are some members of Gen Z who are really, really into sex positive stuff, but there's also the opposite. And you're increasingly seeing women not only reacting against this online, but actually organizing around it online and speaking to each other and being much more assertive in a way that I really, really welcome and being much more kind of they've really wised up to, to some of what's going on. I think that my generation of millennials are probably going to have been the high watermark for sex positive feminism. I think it is now waning. And I think partly the really positive reception to my book is an expression of that. And I've had a lot of communications from young women saying that it really, it really spoke to them, which is so nice. It's, I love getting those emails. are the best thing ever. I think that it was a kind of experiment. I think that we're now, like the results are coming in. We're starting to see the flaws in the idea. And I'm hoping that what we're going to see now is a, as you say, neither a slut nor a prude, but something kind of healthily in the middle. It ought to be possible, right, to have some kind of moderate position somewhere in between. And I'm hoping that we are going to find that in the coming decades and that hopefully, you know, Gen Z are going to be a little bit wiser than my generation were. (laughs) If you want to hear more of my conversation with Louise, I hope that made you think I wonder if you were shouting in your head back at her or maybe even at me. Follow the link in the show notes because in the subscriber episode, we talk about the impact of porn and sex positivity culture and what the downside of that can be for women. People are starting to believe that women do love to be strangled and that this is a normal thing to do and that it's okay to just suddenly... And what's so distressing about it is that I'll hear from women or read women on, on, on social media or whatever saying, I went home with a guy, he started strangling me and I didn't really like it. But, you know, is, does that make me a prude? Is there something wrong with me? And I mean, I think it partly comes back to this agreeableness thing that, that women are so really agreeable. Women do have a tendency to sort of put their partners first. But also is that this whole culture of being up for it and being adventurous. If you're a Mamma Mia subscriber, you can hear all of that right now. And you can find Louise's book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, online now. The executive producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff, and I'm Mia Friedman. Thanks for having me in your ears.